we're really over levered and the solution to being over levered is usually an overactive government playing whack-a-mole to solve problems, which is gonna create great macro opportunities. The great macro dreamscape, that's where we're headed as investors, according to Harris Kupperman, better known as Cuppy. He runs the hedge fund Praetorian Capital and he's our guest this week on Global Macro Update. Cuppy, I, I really appreciate you joining me. I've really, I've become a big fan of your, your investor letter. Your last letter you wrote about the culling, where you just were, were culling your portfolio. And I thought, yeah, that's a, that's a great reminder. I have to do that soon myself. But then you really intrigued me when you, you linked back to an older letter of yours that I hadn't read yet, where you were talking about the, the great macro dreamscape. Could you, Talk a little bit about that concept and that letter, because it's it really jives well with what we do and, and talk about and think about here at Malden Economics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for background on me, I've been investing in markets for almost 25 years now. And this period of time where, you know, you're an investor, you try to figure out what the right earnings multiple is for a stock. And this periods of time where events happen really fast and they move away from you and it doesn't really matter what you think something's worth. Uh, liquidity, fund flows, you know, macro events, they overwhelm whatever the, the, the fair value is. And sometimes you have, you know, forced selling. Sometimes you have, you know, forced liquidity injections by the Fed. Things just happen at a different pace. And we had one of those moments uh, in 2008, 9, 10. We had another one of those moments right after COVID, uh, 2020, 21, and 22. And I have this view that, uh, you know, those moments are where, all the money gets made, you know, it, it, it's very easy. They give you money. Like they, you, they, they, they literally just drop money out of the sky and you just have to show up to work to grab it. And there's moments in time, like uh, after the Eurozone crisis kind of dissipated in 2014 or so until 2019, where it was harder, you had to really work for it. You had to, you know, buy stocks at six times earnings and sell them at nine times earnings. It, it, it was work. It was hard. And I, I like it when it's really easy, where the Federal Reserve tells you exactly what they're going to do. And then you just kind of like listen to them and you ride with it. The last year and a half, two years, uh, you know, 23 and the first half 24, part of 22, it's, it's been more difficult because the Fed's been raising rates. They've been uh, using QT. They, they've been making it a little harder uh, as a long-sided investor, unless you're long NVIDIA, which I'm not. And, you know, my company's like, I've done fine, but my company's, uh, it's been hard to uh, produce alpha. And I got this feeling that uh, there's a lot of unfinished, there's unfinished business. There's a lot of macro imbalances in this world. Uh, there, there's a lot of moving pieces. You know, we can talk about some of these. And I feel like we're in this weird intermission. And the great macro dreamscape is a continuation of 2021 and 22, where they unleash hell with liquidity. And, the, you know, the government's going bankrupt. The, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve is stuffed full of uh, paper. But, I mean, the fiscal situation here is, you know, ridiculous. It's like it's like an emerging market. And I, I think as we have as we get into, you know, dealing with these problems, um, I think it's going to be a macro world again. And I like a macro world because you get to play in big liquid uh, securities that have big, long trending uh, moments in time. It, it, it's what we all live and dream for. I don't have to guess if, you know, six times earnings is the right multiple or not. It's that that's harder. And I, I'm really excited for this. I mean, I think people read uh, when, I, when I posted that uh, last year, people thought of it as like uh, a lot of gloom and doom. And I didn't mean it that way or think of it that way. I, I, I really thought of it as, uh, you know, hope. Obviously, you know, the world's going to fray and a lot of people are going to lose everything they have. But, uh, you know, that's what creates opportunity. And it's really good for me as a hedge fund manager. It, it's kind of terrible if you're, you know, so, some middle class guy uh, that's getting stuffed by inflation. But that's not my problem. You know, I just want to be there, make money for clients. So anyway, that, that's kind of how I think about it. You had this one section of that letter that really, really kind of punched me in the face. Uh, I'm going to read your words to you if you don't mind. You said, I believe we're now entering the golden age of global macro. Old orders are collapsing, pulled down by the weight of their hubris. New orders aren't yet ready to take their place. Chaos is the eager ally of traders with an open mind. I'm excited. Just saying that gets me excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love me too. I read that and I thought, yes, our time is coming. Not not that I want to see the, the the bad parts of it, but to your point about the markets for the last couple of years, it's like dumber was better. Yes. Buy stuff that's going up, buy tech. Um, and that that can be discouraging to 
to those of us that sort of think more thematically. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a harder moment, but I really do think that there's a passing of the baton from the West to you know Asia, uh, Middle East, all these countries that kind of want to work hard and you know they have ambition and we've gotten kind of fat and lazy on this side of the of, of the globe and uh, if we're not going to work for it someone else is going to take it from us and you know but th- they're not ready yet they, it's this weird uh, intermission moment you know empires have an arc and they kind of you know you know it goes up and then it kind of falls over and it's all got its own little timeline and you know it, it I feel like it's it's past the prime here because we've had terrible leadership, and this isn't you know saying anything about our current uh, president. Although he, I don't think he knows he's his, he's the president, but uh, we, we've had a bunch of them in a row that are pretty terrible, and we, we've surrendered all leadership and you know the moral high ground that we had after World War II, and now we just kind of go around bombing poor countries, and that doesn't really uh, engender uh, goodwill, I don't think. And people don't really want to do business with us, and people want to do business with uh, other countries now. And we have to actually fight for it and produce better products. And it, it's going to be a weird moment because we're really over-levered, and the solution to being over-levered is usually uh, an overactive government playing whack-a-mole to solve problems, which is going to create great macro opportunities. We're over-levered which means we need foreigners to buy more of our debt. Well, we can buy our own debt, but that's just going to, you know, be inflationary too. I mean, at some point you have to, like, you don't have to run a balanced budget, right? But you have to run a budget that roughly tracks nominal GDP so the deficit doesn't get worse and preferably, you know, run your nominal GDP faster than uh, your budget deficit so it shrinks over time. But we're not really doing that. I mean, we, we haven't been doing that. And that's why the deficit is expanding. And I mean, we're actually getting in the way of the, the free market clearing. I'm a free market sort of guy. Uh, and I, I, I think we've meddled with the free market far too much. But there's a lot of problems and a lot of flaws. And I think eventually uh, you can either just wither away or you can rip the bandaid off. And ripping the bandaid off is probably going to be an epic recession, depression. And I don't think they're going to do that because in a democracy, you never do that. So there's a sort of preordained uh, path here. And, you know, you can have some variance along that path, but I think everyone kind of knows what the path looks like. And it's going to really suck for most people. But since I know the path, it's going to be a lot of fun for me. I'm really excited. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of misery and suffering, but I, I got a feeling that I'm going to make some money. What do you think it looks like? I mean, what are, what are some of the key elements of the, of the macro dreamscape and, and how would you trade them? Well, you haven't had a first world nation really collapse like this since the U.K., It's going to be inflationary. You're going to have the government getting in the way. You know, they're going to probably do price caps and floors and interfere in the free market, which means you end up with less of stuff, which increases inflation. Um, They're probably going to eventually have to devalue the currency, which is probably, you know, part of the solution to the problem. But it's highly inflationary. Plus, it means that your stuff at Walmart costs twice as much, which is going to, you know, upset a lot of voters. Um, They're going to do a lot of things that are going to be disruptive and probably make the problem worse. But I think, you know, if you think of this uh, on a linear path, uh, you know, I think the, the experience in Brazil over the last uh, 20 years is, is a really, you know, interesting guidepost where inflation accelerated then it slowed it accelerated, it slowed. There were good years and bad years. It, it made it really complicated for people. Overall, the stock market was up because, you know, when, when, when you print money and you devalue your currency, the market goes up. But there were real winners and losers, you know, and I think eventually it starts looking more like Turkey where, you know, you just have more inflation and then you probably get to Argentina and, you know, where nothing works anymore. And, you know, the, the economy is kind of just frozen. Uh, I hope we don't get there, but I don't see anyone in leadership trying to do anything to, to, to fix it. Obviously, you want to be long inflationary assets and there's certain assets that do better than others in an inflationary cycle. We also want to just be investing outside of the inflation entirely, go to places around the world that are doing the right things. I I think there's a lot of uh, different tools and it depends where you are in the cycle. But um, I I mean, for me, just knowing where the path leads is is half the battle. Is it fair to say that you take geopolitics into account quite a bit when you invest? I I think you have to, right? Um, I do too. And the geopolitical situation is a total mess too. I, yeah. I, I, I don't understand why we're involved in half the little skirmishes we are around the world. Like we seem to pick fights all over the place. Uh, I, you know, obviously, you know, the military industrial complex loves it because they make money out of it. But it seems like our politicians like it too, because for whatever reason, bombing poor people is popular in America. 
And we, we seem to do a lot of that too. Uh, but always it was a poor country that couldn't really fight back. And now suddenly we're uh, messing with Russia's nuclear power. And, you know, you, you, you're always seconds away from a disaster. You know, they could overreact. Putin can show up to work one day in a bad mood and press the button. I don't think he's going to. He's shown an incredible amount of restraint. But you can only push a man so far. And it, it could go really bad in a hurry is what I'm saying. And there's no reason for this. Like, I'm not mad at Russia. I'm not really mad at Putin. I have Russian friends. I have Ukrainian friends. I, I think if we were a real country run by adults, we'd find a peaceful solution to this instead of just supplying more weapons and leading to more people my age who are dead. It just doesn't seem like the right solution, right? And yet, as people who run money, uh, you have to think about the, that side of it. What, how do you manage a portfolio? You, you and I have a mutual friend in, in Louis Gav from GavCal. Yeah. He always talks about how he feels like uh, the, the most anti-fragile asset in existence today is energy. How, how are you feeling about energy right now? I agree with him. I mean, energy tracks global GDP, and, you know, that drives demand. It's, it's a commodity with supply and demand uh, equation. Uh, and the global economy isn't doing so well, so the price is down. But, you know, you're, you're seconds away from uh, the supply side cutting off because of some accident somewhere, and the price screams out of control. Uh, I'd, I'd say you want to be long, uh, what I, I, I just call them uh, like implied volatility assets. You know, precious metals, obviously in a crisis, scream. Uh, I'm long a company that is one of the largest dealers of precious metals. It's, it's, it is my volatility hedge. A company called Amark, and the ticker is AMRK. They're one of the largest dealers of gold and silver coins. And I, I think we're going to get to a part of this cycle where, you know, your average guy is going to want to have a couple coins uh, stored somewhere in his backyard, you know, because it, it's just a natural thing to do to have some gold. And I think everyone should have some physical gold. It's not investment advice. It's just common sense. And if you don't, you probably should get some. And if you have some, you should probably get some more. Um, and so, you know, I, I like assets like that. I have a whole collection of assets like that that will do well as the world gets more weird. Can we maybe unpack one of your one of your more well-known trades, sort of how you got into it, what drew you to it, how you approach a trade? And I'm thinking about uranium because you're it, 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 at least on on X, formerly known as Twitter, I mean, like you're you're sort of the a legendary guy when it comes to investing in uranium. You got it right. You were in it back in 21. How did you get into it, and what what was the setup that got your attention? I was really lucky that I played uranium the last cycle, and so I made a lot of money the last cycle. It, it, it was unusually good to me, right? And so I've always had a sweet spot for uranium. But the problem is that after Fukushima, there was just this uh, excess supply and the world had too much of it and it pushed the price down. And as always happens with commodities, they do a lot of commodity investing. Uh, you know, the, there's too much supply, the price goes down and eventually a bunch of guys go bankrupt. They stop producing. And then, you know, you, you, you have a deficit and, you know, the, the pricing fixes itself. It's just, you know, in these things, every commodity is a different cycle. And this one, it, it took uh, over a decade from Fukushima until we hit bottom. Well, I guess we hit bottom a little earlier, but before you started seeing any life come into it. But in, in 2021, we were year uh, three of the, the deficits. And so we started, you know, drawing down above ground inventory. But a funny thing happened in that... Um, Countries that had previously said they were shutting the nuclear power plants, did they all made these green commitments? And solar, you know, doesn't work when it's not sunny, and wind sometimes doesn't work when it's not windy. And they had too much intermittent power, not enough base load. And they realized that if they were going to continue to phase out their coal power plants, they needed to keep the nuclear on. And so we had all these plants that were supposed to be shutting down nuclear power plants that instead, you know, got, got postponements where they were allowed to stay on longer. The Japanese and Koreans decided they were going to turn plants back on. The French uh, decided that they were going to go full in nuclear. In the U.S., we did some of this, this the same. And so you had this weird situation where, you know, the market was supposed to be balanced based on the current amount of production or maybe a slight deficit. And instead, the deficit became very, very large because, uh, the, the demand for uh, uranium went up much more rapidly than the supply could. And even today, uh, three years later, 
the supply response has really been slow because it's really hard to uh, build a, a mine. And there's a bunch of existing mines that are mothballed, but even those take a while to, to come online. But the real catalyst was that uh, an entity called Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, uh, uh, it was launched. It's a Canadian entity. We're shareholders for disclosure. And uh, it, it was issuing shares and buying pounds. And it sequestered now uh, over 60 million pounds of physical uranium. And that helped clear up a lot of the above ground inventories that now the deficit can impact the price. And it has impacted the price. When I first started buying, the price of uranium was in the low 30s. To today, it's in the mid 80s. It got as high as uh, like 105 or so. So it's, it's been an OK trade for me. I mean, I've had better trades. I've had worse trades. But it, 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 it's, it's done well. And I think uh, it, it's going to continue to do well. And I think at the end of this cycle, as usually happens, there'll be... Um, an explosion higher in price. Uh, usually near the end of these sort of things, there's a panic and the price goes crazy. And that's what you need to incentivize governments around the world to supply the uranium. You know, there's plenty of uh, uranium. Like, you, it's not like the power is going to go out, but you're going to need to take this nuclear power out of some other thing like an aircraft carrier. And then to do that, you, you, you need the price to go crazy and you need uh, the guys who had this... Uh, spare, uh, you know, governmental uranium to say, OK, we'll give it to the the, the, the commercial market and, and kind of uh, bridge the gap. And so we're not there yet. And when we start getting there, that's when I sell. My understanding is we're not even close to the price point yet for spot uranium, where it is economical to restart a lot of the, the mothballed mines, at least the ones that are in North America. Yeah, sort of. Not really. The, the thing is that these mines, they produced a lot of them a decade ago. And so, you know, they, they, they were at today's price of, say, 85, they'd be very profitable. But it's been a decade of inflation and it, it's hard to say what what the right price is. At the same time, you know, permits lapsed and there's really not a lot of capital in the industry. I mean, there's a huge uranium bubble going on in the juniors. But despite that bubble, the bubble and it really is a bubble, um, there's not a lot of capital available, which is just odd. So you're not seeing a lot of these restarts. Um, I, I think you'll see that eventually in this cycle. That, that's how the cycle ends. But that, that's not now. We're kind of in the, in the mid-stride of the cycle. What do you think about the processing side? Because my, my understanding is we have very little, if any, processing as well, a refinement of, of uranium. Uh, so we we're essentially relying on Russia for the refining. We are. And it's, it's, it's very stupid. We, we should be able to <laughs> – I mean, it's about 15 percent of our electricity in America. We should be able to uh, do this ourselves. Uh, there's a couple steps along the way. Uh, you know, you, you have to take uh, uranium and turn it into UF6. Then you have to enrich it. Then you have to uh, fabricate it into fuel rods. Uh, w we're short on all of this stuff. Um, the Russians do it cheaper. They do it better. Um, and we closed our plants. We like much like much of uh, America. We outsourced all this stuff, uh, which which may may have made you know good financial sense for a bunch of public companies, but it doesn't make good uh, national security sense. And now, you know, we're fully at the mercy of the Russians. If they stop supplying us with enriched uranium, we're gonna have a real big problem here. Um, but even if you want to buy and you know build an enrichment facility, it takes years. So there's this bottlenecks, and that's one of the reasons, actually, that the price of uranium hasn't gone up more. Uh, no one's out there buying uh, U308, you know, raw, raw uranium, because there's, there's a shortage right now in terms of enrichment and also in, in terms of uh, UF6 conversion. So, you know, you're not going to buy the, the, the initial components if you can't actually turn it into a fuel rod. So, you know, because of that supply chain, it's all sort of backed up and, you know, you haven't really pulled forward some of that demand. So I think as these things get solved, I think you'll see the demand uh, for uh, physical uranium, the thing that I own, uh, also grow. This is all kind of like a a small example of what I see happening playing out across a whole bunch of different commodities that we've given up production or refinement of. I, I really think that over the next four to five years, we're going to have kind of what I'm calling resiliency inflation, where, where we're going to have to start finding our own sources of certain commodities, rare earths, um, f fuel of any type, um, cert, cert, you know, fertilizer, like this, this we globalize and now we're deglobalizing. And I just don't see how inflation is really going to get under control long term until 
the supply chains of all these important commodities really get sorted out. Yeah, I, I agree completely. We should be uh, self-sufficient in as many things as we can be self-sufficient. The, the, the issue is that it's really hard to get permits to do anything in, in, in America. You have these uh, small little groups of people that get in the way. And I'm all for, you know, the environment and let, let's not screw up, uh, you know, beautiful places. But you, you have to build the mine somewhere and you have to build the fabrication plant somewhere. And, you know, if it takes 10 years to get a permit, no one's going to want to do those investments when you can just do it overseas. And not only do they like thank you for your investment, but usually the taxes are lower, the regulations lower, your cost structure is lower. It, it, it's a total stupid mess. And that's why, you know, we've kind of surrendered uh, a lot of our self-sufficiency. And it, it's a big mistake, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think unwinding it is going to be messy. And inflationary. And inflationary. Do you ever play around with other pockets of energy? I'm, I'm thinking about... Um, Hydrogen, for example, there's a, there's a company in your neck of the woods and that, that does some work in Puerto Rico called New Fortress Energy, uh, founded by the guy who was one of the co-founders of Fortress Investing, Wes Edens. Um, <clears throat> they built a couple of uh, LNG uh, power plants in Puerto Rico uh, for FEMA, uh, and now they're getting into hydrogen. Um, their stock is a total disaster. <laughs> the chart is terrible. But but there's just something intriguing about the story. I've got one eye on that stock because hydrogen is an area that I think could get some traction. Have, have you looked at it? I think hydrogen could work. I mean, it makes a lot of logical sense. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's natural hydrogen that's produced in America. It actually seeps out of the earth. Uh, there's a bunch of places in the U.S. where you could drill a well and produce hydrogen and you can turn that into electricity. I think that's going to be a big thing, but it's probably going to take 20 or 30 years to figure it out. It's it's kind of a science experiment now, right? But it, I could see that being part of the future. Um, we, we spent some time on that, actually, at, at our fund. It's a couple of small little companies that have staked some ground and they obviously need capital. Uh, we, we just, I don't see how it turns into revenue. It's a science fair experiment right now. Someone will make a lot of money at it. Yeah, it does seem like early days. One of the things that they're doing is is blending hydrogen in with natural gas at power plants to lower lower emissions overall, which are already pretty low when you're burning natural gas. But um, they they seem to think that that's the next uh, the the next great thing. I don't know. It could be. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm a very much a revenue and cash flow sort of guy. Uh, I don't usually get into any of this uh, new science stuff. Uh, I, I, I like to keep it super simple. So uh, do you invest in tech? No, I don't understand tech. I, yeah. I, I wish I understood tech. I, I would have had a very good year. But no, I like I said, I, I, buy, I buy a lot of things at like three and five times next year's cash flow. I buy things at huge discount to replacement cost. I, I, I buy kind of curmudgeon assets, but that have huge macro tailwinds that give me multi-bagger uh, upside potential. You know, uh, the stuff I like right now is offshore energy uh, services. I think it's still left for dead. A lot of these things are up a ton, but you know, you have companies like Valeris where I think it trades at about 10 cents on the dollar of the replacement cost of the equipment. And that's wow. usually a good starting point for an investment, especially when they're the largest player. They should have huge economies of scale. They traded a huge discount to a lot of their competitors. Uh, you might ask why there's a discount. And, you know, the discount is that uh, a lot of their contracts are locked in at bad prices because, you know, beggars can't be choosers two or three years ago when, when, when they signed these contracts. And the contracts hopefully renew at much better rates over the next few years. And I think you just see a lot of cash flow. I think it's a uh, two, three, four times cash flow sort of company playing it forward 18 months. Like that's usually a really good starting point for an investment. Um, you know, I, I like things like that. Really, really simple. Uh, you know, we own a company in uh, Florida that uh, owns a lot of land called St. Joe. Uh, I think we're paying about 20 cents on the dollar for lands in Florida. I mean, you never go broke on land in Florida. I mean, it only goes up, right? If I recall, I looked at them once. They're big in uh, in the Panhandle, if I recall. Yes, yes. Uh, and the okay. Panhandle is one of the prettiest places in Florida. It is. Uh, it's actually one of the fastest growing places in Florida. Mm -hmm. And because they own effectively two counties, they can make these big long-term investments where every time you build something of value, everything next to it goes up in value. 
So you build a marina and then all the acres go up in value. You build a new hospital like they are. Well, you know, all the acres go up in value. You know, everything you do is cumulative. It's very different from, you know, most home builders where you build 200 homes and then, you know, you, you, you just move away and you never come back. You don't care what happens. These guys have a you know forever commitment to these two counties in Florida. They, they, they're in about a dozen counties in total. And uh, I think they're making really smart long term moves. But you could buy it at 20 cents in the dollar. It's got a bunch of cash flow. Uh, there's a bunch of commercial real estate they're building that they're going to flip the switch on this year. And the cash flow will keep growing. But if you look at it, all the numbers are up and to the right. It's growing 20 to hundred percent a year, depending on which metric you look at. Like there's a growth company. I like growth companies and you can buy it really cheap. I mean, these are the sort of things we own. Uh, really simple. I, I go up there with my wife. We love it up there. We go up there every year. We get an Airbnb for a week and we just see it advancing. It's, it's it, it just feels good to walk around because you know that it's worth more each year. <laughs> Cuppy, how can listeners uh, find out more about you and maybe get access to your uh, your investor note, which I, I can't recommend enough. It always makes me think. Thanks. Uh, go to praycap.com, P-R-A-C-A-P, and you can sign up for the blog. It's free. Uh, you know, if you want to learn more about my fund and you're accredited, uh, you can drop us a note also and uh, someone on the client side will reach out. Uh, but I also have uh, a Twitter account or X, as they call themselves these days. And you can find me at HCUPPY, H-K-U-P-P-Y. Before you leave, I want to invite you to join my Global Macro Update newsletter. This is a free service that comes out every Tuesday and Friday. I'll send you an email with my latest thoughts on geopolitics, economics, the markets, along with a link to the latest interview and a transcript. If you'd like to join us, hit the link in the description below or go to globalmacroupdate.com and join over 100,000 other Global Macro Update readers. I hope you join us. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for watching.